um, since I'm pretty sure everyone here is aware of um, GPT-4, ChatGPT right now. Um, another technology um, that I've been excited about is Lane Chain. Um, so this is a specific framework that solves the memory problem more or less with a lot of these large language models. Uh, I think GPT-4 right now only consume up to like a 16 thousand uh, token context. So for each token, that's I think like four characters, like ASCII characters. Um, so you're limited to the size of your prompt for it to actually recall or to, you know, relate to in its response, um, else it would essentially forget. It can only remember so much. Uh, with LangChain, it works with OpenAI where essentially um, and I think I've did a tech talk on this before, but for those who didn't attend or don't remember, um, what it does, it uses OpenAI's um, embedding API, where essentially it compresses your prompt. So in this case, it could be a PDF document or some large like uh, body of text that you wanted to restrict its knowledge base mostly to, while also taking advantage of the natural language processing capabilities that ChatGPT has, but just to restrict it, you know, maybe say a data sheet that you want to query or maybe company policies that you wanted to leverage for customer support or product um, you know, explanations and so on, or maybe onboarding, IT, you name it. Um, if you have like a large database of documents, a book even, and you want the language model to specifically restrict itself to that. That's essentially what LangChain does, where um, it essentially compresses the prompt in such a way that uh, it can remember contextually what it's talking about when you ask questions. So other technologies that I have not uh, spoke about before. Um, so we have um, Hugging Face models. So Hugging Face is this website uh, where it's a, essentially a lot of like hobbyists, AI researchers, students, you name it, essentially aggregate their uh, models that they train and data sets and so on for anyone to you know, use for whatever purpose they have. Um, licensing permitted, I think most of it is free use or like a uh, copy left. Um, Llama, for instance, was technically leaked, so whatever you use with Llama, you can't make anything proprietary with it. However, Llama 2, as you probably see on the page here, has recently been released, which you can use for commercial use. But for the most part, um, most of everyone who's posting here is using the original Llama leak model for training these text generation models. But they do include assortment of others, such as like image to image, text to image, yada, yada. I have not experimented with, it, with any of these other uh, modes. I've only and really plan around with text generation since that's has like the highest innovation rate right now since that's the most relevant to a lot of people uh, but yeah there is a gigantic plethora of um, all kinds of models and the, the ones uh, I mostly use would be like whatever the bloke post he, he seems to be pretty up to speed but so there's different accounts so you can imagine like a github you click on any of these There'll be a, a short readme for the model card. Um, how do you configure the prompts? Some basic like, explanations of what it's doing, file sizes, what the model is. But all you really need is just a link to this if you were to upload. And I'll show this momentarily about how do you actually use these models. So for right now I'm just going through my outline and then I'll go through my examples. So alongside with these models, uh, so how do you make a new model? Like, what are people actually doing the llama models? Why there's so many different versions? Well, in short, what people are doing is doing uh, very minor fine tuning to these models. And the most popular method to do that is called LoRa, which is low rank adaptation. So these models are very expansive. They could be 7 billion, 13 billion, 30 billion, 65 billion parameters. Uh, most commonly, people are using our uh, 15 and 30 billion parameter size language models right now. Just for context, uh, GPT-4 is in hundreds of billions of uh, parameters for their tra tra transform a model. So that's really big. No one right now is even able to hail a comparison to compete with GPT-4, but everything it has so far been pretty proximal to the capabilities of chat GPT right now currently. Um, and which is pretty great because chat GPT 
which is version 3.5 of their um, of models that OpenAI offers, is very uh, you know sufficient for most use cases that people are asking for. Um, and I think from my experience using these models, and which I'll show in the future right now, uh, is that essentially you can run these things locally and you can fine tune them using um, this lower concept where instead of uh, using each layer um, to its full dimension matrix, because essentially how these models are, is just like doing a lot of linear algebra math, like a large ranked matrices. In this case, you're doing uh, minimized ranked matrices, so very like small matrices, which essentially when you do the map on each layer of the models, uh, you're, you're not essentially doing a whole lot of computation, so it can really speed up things along if you want to fine tune it to a specific data set that you have, for example, company policies or IP, for, for example, you can have it fine tune to just that um, instead of being restricted to whatever else it was trained. So this can allow like censored models or open AI, uh, the common term that is alignment. So, you know, you can align your models using LoRa. And there's different variations of this, like QLAR, which I do not explain here since I'm not exactly too familiar with it. But, you know, with a few days time, you can train and fine tune a model using this lower method. Um, next thing is uh, cloud GPU. So for me, I'm running on a, a potato toaster of a computer, so I don't have, you know, an NVIDIA graphics card or any like anything advanced that can run these things pretty fast. So what I have been using is uh, runpod.io, which is pretty cool. So on runpod.io, um, you can essentially rent a GPU on demand as you use um, and deploy, you know, these type of AI applications on, on the go. Um, so essentially you pay by the minute um, or by the hour or whatnot. And I can go through that right now, actually. So I have an account, I have $15 on my account right now. So let's say I want to deploy um, an AI and when I'm going to deploy, um, it's not quite order, I want to deploy Uba Booga text generation web UI, which I think is the most popular um, like model um, UI at the moment. It's something that runs on JavaScript on your browser that interfaces with these models so that you can query them as if you would with chat TPT. But in this case, you can completely, you know, bound it to your local network or your local machine. It doesn't have to be on the internet. And that's really good for development and deployment and for any specific use case. So that's what I'm gonna do right here. So I'm gonna hit deploy. Right, so you have an assortment of different GPUs. Um, so the most advanced ones right now, um, I think I've been using the A100 SXM 80 gigabyte VRAM. So this is the, this, the Quadro series of NVIDIA. Um, I mean, right now this is pretty overkill, but um, I don't know, I think it's pretty neat that <laughs> if I can have an 80 gigabyte VRAM graphics card, because that blows my mind. I never use anything that large. I must, I've ever used was eight gigabytes. But this is the computational demand for a lot of these larger parameter data uh, models for these uh, language models. So I'm going to deploy one. Um, so I'm going to hit deploy. All right, so you can customize your deployment, um, you know, such as like setting up the ports. I'm just going to set the defaults that I already had here. Um, so you can set the space. Um, you, you do pay mostly for the storage. But, but since this is only temporary, I'm just going to keep it small for now. Don't make that much. Because, you know, you need enough to store the model itself. All right. And yeah, I can set my overrides. And then, you know, you can encrypt the volume. So if you have anything stored on the cloud here, you know, while it's not running, you can have it, you know, encrypt or whatever. So I can click that. And then here it'll tell you um, if you want it on demand or spot. So on demand in this case means like once you have it um, running, no one else can um, have priority over your GPU that you're using. So it's no interruption, whereas it could be interrupted. And they do have uh, different services. You have Secure Cloud, which is uh, has like the encryption and uh, and private servers that are proprietary to this company, RunPod, or Community Cloud, which is 
not as secure as you probably can imagine. So I'll just say continue. You know, tell me like my GPU cost. So while it's running, it's gonna be a dollar eighty four per hour. Uh, running cost, you know, it's a fractions of a penny included. So hit deploy. That does it pretty fast. And this is a template I found, um, so I'm just running that. All right, uh, says there's maintenance scheduled, so hopefully that's not going to conflict. So anyway, you hit, you, you you would start it, and with this specific graphics card, you can have up to three running simultaneously. So technically, I don't have just 80 gigabytes at my disposal. I can have 240. The more you have, uh, the faster you can. Uh, oh wait, wait, I already have one running. I don't need this one running. Let me turn that off. Didn't realize. Yeah, so I'm gonna act. Okay. So here's the interface. So. Right now, there's no model, so if we go to model, there's nothing here. So what you do, you go to select your model. Um, the one I have, I'm gonna use is this Erebor's one, which is trained on GPT-4 output. Um, and it's using the super hot uh, LoRa, which is essentially extends the context up to 8,000 parameters. So I'm gonna copy that link here. So you download custom model for Laura. So you just put the link in, hit download. All right. And then once it's finished download, you, you have to set the uh, model loader. So there's different loaders. Um, so we have like the transporter. Transformers, X Llama, Auto GPTQ, GPTQ for Llama, Llamas.ccp. Essentially, what these does it is just tells it like how to interpret the model files. Um, so for in this case, um, using I'll be using X Llama HF, just like uh, I think high, HF is high frequency, if I recall correctly. Um, don't ask exactly you know why they chose a certain nomenclature, but um, And once I have this finished downloading, I'll switch to that without breaking anything by accident. Any questions so far? Nothing specific yet, but this is very interesting so far. Yes, it is. So does it show you where the meter is running somewhere? That's right here. Ours running. No, I meant uh, your your hourly rate. Oh, uh, dollars left, right, like a taxi cab. Yeah, right here. So my current spending, it tells me right here, and how much I have on here, and you can add credits and whatnot. Okay, so they, they oh, I did yeah. one one layer down. Yeah, and if you go to templates, now you got community templates or you can create your own template. Um, so they have ones for stable diffusion on here too. So if you want to do text to image, you do that, which I have not done yet because uh, th those those are like very large files um, to just keep stored on the cloud for me at the moment. Um, but yeah, I think the, the Uba Booga text generation web UI is pretty fantastic, honestly. Um, so, all right, so we have it finished downloading, so I'm going to refresh so that it sees it. So I'm going to have that loaded up right there. So I'm going to hit the X llama. So this should go up to 8K. So it's not exactly 8K, but it's a, you know, a power of two. So it's going to be 8192 for Mexico length. And for the embeddings here, and just to confirm, it would tell you on the model card here, uh, yeah, so yes, increase contact to 81 to 92 and compression to four. 
contacts and two for four ninety six. So back here. All right, so that should be sufficient. Save the settings and reload. So with this particular model, I don't I don't think it's a lot. It doesn't have any alignments, so it can output dangerous um, output. So keep that in mind. Uh, so if if, there, if a product is to be made off of these, it would have to be a lot of Q and A involved with ensuring that it's not going to give anything back. Because it, it it will essentially attempt to answer illegal prompts um, <laughs> if you were to do so. Um, okay, so. Each different type of model does have a unique instruction uh, of like what it expects for the prompt. So on chat GPT, what you don't see is the system level prompt. So that's essentially like what's going on behind the scenes. So OpenAI has their own prompt, you know, that gets attached to whatever prompt you provide, which essentially is a way for them to keep it aligned and ensure like specific outputs. So for this particular model, I the user should have an example with the prompt is fine tuned to be used with. Uh, so let me find that. All right, so uses the looks like the user assistant. All right, and you can have like something below here. So like you are a helpful AI assistant who answers, yeah, or I can skip it as that. All right, so the user can ask, um, so uh, anyone got something that they want to try? Oh, it's okay. I, this may be too general for it, but uh, maybe something, uh, how would you, you know, ask, uh, how would you use your capabilities for uh, reducing cognitive load of, robotics uh control units something along that line maybe it can get uh, refined all right so let's see if it doesn't so i have it uh limit i forgot to change the max token output limit so we'll see and i can have it continue So this is not connected to anything else. It's just running on this cloud server using this really super cutting edge GPU from NVIDIA. And it did it pretty fast. This is a 30 billion parameter model. So it's probably not even 10% of what GPT-4 is, but it's pretty darn good. I mean, if I read this, let's see if it's close to what you asked. I mean, it's pretty generally correct, I think, from just glancing at it. It's nothing technically specific, but is that? Yeah, it seems like a solid answer. I guess, you know, you could we could ask it to dive deeper on on things if we wanted to in this topic. Um, I don't know if uh, how, you know, how technical it could get in to things. Uh, if you asked it more detailed about, uh, you know, automating routine tasks, maybe um on a more technical level how it would be able to complete that um yeah i could but oh probably gonna yeah i mean if you if, if you have more stuff to go into but yeah i think that's uh but is there any... um yeah, yeah so this is a, a notebook interface um so you're probably more familiar with like the chat type interface which you can set um so on the session there's like the mode is default to the model, so you can set the chat where it's just like user and you input your box and then there's a chat bubble for the AI's response to your prompt and it goes back and forth like that. In this case, it's a notebook. 
Um, and you have a lot of flexibility of modifying these parameters. Um, so like temperature, which is the entropy of the output. So the higher the temperature, um, the less deterministic the output would be. So more creativity variety, but sometimes if it's too high, it can get very nonsensical. Um, so the, sometimes you want lower temperature if you want it to be ter deterministic, such as like, you know, maybe, maybe you want to have it like a math problem, right? You know, there's only one answer typically for most problems, so you might want to have a lower temperature, but if it's something like creative writing, then yeah, you, you want the temperature to be pretty high. And amongst other things like repetition penalty, so for each new token that's generated, you know, you don't, maybe you don't want it to repeat previous tokens, so sometimes it might find itself like repeating the same thing over and over again, you want some penalty to that. Um, like, you know, for example, you know, someone screaming, ah, right, that can go on forever. Eyes <laughs> perspective, so you might want to have some repetition penalty um, to that. Uh, and then there's other things like uh, probability. So with the certainty of what it believes to be the most probable next token output, um, you know, there's a threshold for that. So do you want it to be like 80% certain, 70%? So this pretty much like what a lot of these would do. Um, you know, you can truncate the, the prompt too. So since I'm already using AK context, I just have a stupid AK, but you can truncate the smaller if you want it to be smaller. Um, and this is not the highest I found that right now is capable. I, I have seen 16,000 um, token prompt um, in some of these models, but um, that's not what I'm using right now. But it's, it's This is a recent innovation with um, what the open source community has been pretty much diving into, which is pretty fantastic, I think, because, you know, whatever is happening on the, the proprietary private sector with these large language models, uh, it seems like the hobbyist researcher communities pretty much like pushing it forward themselves pretty fast. Um, and then here in the training card, you can, this is where you can do LoRa. So you, without really knowing much about LoRa, um, you, you can fine tune these models as well by uploading you know, existing files or overriding amongst like, you know, how large the low ranking matrices that are going to be used to um, modify each layer computationally. Because, you know, obviously the larger it is, the longer it's going to take for the training to occur. Um, and this could take, this this could take like two days, 48 hours or, or more. Um, so it's still a pretty computationally intensive thing. So that's why these cloud GPUs allow you know, the flexibility of doing that without, you know, investing thousands of dollars of your own hardware. And then, which is also really cool. What's the data input for that? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, so where was it? Um, yes, yeah, so they can do a raw text file or you can format it the data set. So. But it, is yeah. it like, I mean, what is it looking for? Like, Q and A or um, anything. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you want to fine tune it to like um, maybe a book, you can do that. Um, I, th I think with pre preferably you want to keep it consistent with what it's been trained overall in. So in this case, it's trained on like user assistant conversations, right? Mm -hmm. So you wanted to have like a text file of example of like user assistant, user assistant, user assistant, perhaps. But that's not, uh, you know, necess absolutely necessary. Um, you you could train it on anything you want. It's just you know whatever the behavior that's going to emerge from that. I mean that's to be discovered. Um, yeah, where, where was I? Uh, oh yeah, and then you can have the API key. So if you don't want to just use this web uh, UI, um, there is an API that you can access um, where you can integrate this into your own application in the sim same way as what you can do with GPT-4's API, um, which is really cool. So like you, you can essentially use any LLM you want um, since it's all using the similar thing. So moving forward, uh, there's another, Alternative to Ubabuga, there's something called Cobode um, CCPP or AI. Um, it's pretty similar to Web U UI, except it's more catered towards like chat characters or assistance. So like um, maybe for like customer service or for role playing or for like creating NPC characters in video games or 
um, some type some type of like one on one assistant type of applications. Um, the, whereas the Uba Booga is more flexible than just that. It can, you know, you can use this for anything, especially with the notebook format of that. Um, so other AI technologies um, that I've been you know familiar with, I, you probably seen my demonstration of the WebSDR um, application I made that automatically interfaced with a website that had internet connector radios and to find active frequencies and tune to that and record and yada yada. Um, so this isn't a large language, mo language model per se, but um, it is, you know, uses a lot of OCR and it can definitely complement tremendously with these um, large language model technology because what RPA lacks in is, you know, you have to hard code what it to look for in HTML to know what JavaScript elements to interact with, if any, right? So that could change, that could be differ, differ, that could be different amongst any website, especially websdr.org, since, you know, each web interface could be unique. But hey, you just have to pipe in the HTML contents and you can have it, the larger language model, to find out what it's likely to be the, the button or like the, the, you know the react asset that you wanted to interact with right so you can use this light large language model technologies uh, right now and have it essentially interact with a website as if it were human um so that's pretty cool so for more of the technical side of things um just to highlight so you know how are people able to run this on their machine without using a cloud device. So I have a cloud PC, so I'm kind of cheating right now, but I'm just demonstrating since it's a Windows machine and I assume most of y'all have a Windows machine. So um, this is Shadow uh, Tech uh, PC. So essentially it's a cloud PC where you rent out on a monthly basis, just like 50 bucks that I'm paying for right now. A, um, you know, a, I think it's using a temp gen. I mean, Open up the specs. Oh, no, that's not what I wanted. Yeah, so using a 32 core processor, 2.8 gigahertz, four cores, right? It's pretty decent. Um, and then for my GPU, um, it doesn't say, but it's a A4500 uh, series quadro. Um, card so it's like 22 gigabytes ram vram um which i think right now on the market it's probably like a grand at least or maybe two grand but it, it's still pretty good so 22 gigabytes with that much i can run a 13 billion parameter model so here i have the wizard vacuna 13 billion uncensored gptq model so this is a model that you can run on your gpu entirely if it says GGML, it's essentially it's a model that can run on your CPU if you don't have a super, you know, powerful GPU, and you can offload some of it into your VRAM if you need if you need to, but it's just going to be a lot slower. These models run tremendously faster on the on the GPU, so it's preferable. So I have Ubabunga running on this machine. So the model I was just demonstrating was a 30 billion. This one's 13 billion. So it's not going to be as um, potentially coherent and perplexity to what I was demonstrating, but it's still good. You know, it really depends on your application. If you have like a specific application where it's fine for what you need, you know, maybe like making your own Alexa to like interact with your smart home devices, this is more than you need. Maybe even for robot commands, perhaps. I haven't experimented, but I think, you know, where it doesn't need to know a whole lot of context of what you're talking about, it's great. So in this case, um, you know, I have that model running so I don't, I don't think I, let me see if I already configured it. Uh, let's see, like, how are the stars aligned? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, so still pretty fast. Um, so this is something anyone can really run as long as you have like maybe a 3000 series NVIDIA graphics card. Maybe a, a 1080 Ti could work too. Um, you, you just have to use a lower model. And essentially, you know, how they make these work at you know, 
cheaper hardware. It, they use the trick using quantization. So the weights that make up the connections between each layer in the neural net, um, I think a lot of them are trained using float floating point like 16 or 32 bit weights. And the quantization essentially takes advantage. Well, you know, you don't need the entire um, resolution of those weights. You can get away with using like four bits, or like or the, just a lower byte of the of the, of the weights, and you can still get pretty coherent output. Um, so this is just one trick where they can reduce the size and complexity of these models by like a thousand times, essentially, um, by just simply reducing you know what is usable in the weights that make up these models um, which is pretty great and then there's a like little cool thing about like what what is a large language model um so part of it's like the hierarchy of thought where elements uh process information where it's like you know think of a brain where you know you have your amygdala which is your monk our monkey brain or primal brain which is like in the center which deals with most of our reflexes are uh, quote unquote instinctual tendencies and then beyond that we have developed the cerebral cortex which is where much of our rational thinking emerges from and the, how these large language models work it essentially is like asking itself you know like this internal dialogue or monologue where it's able to like figure out what is the most contextually coherent in its output and then most of the modern language models they're using a transformer type network so if, if you're anyone's familiar with neural nets in general you have uh like forward convolutional neural nets which is probably like the most basic neural net i learned how to make a neural net using a fcn uh, model which is essentially a feed forward and back propagation structure um, and then you have convolutional neural nets which are typically used for like image identification you got recurrent neural nets, which are used for like signal processing, like, you know, recognizing audio um, or anything that can be like done stochastically. Transformers are most similar to recurrent neural nets because it is a stochastical model mostly. And I think there are newer innovations I saw that uh, OpenAI was publishing, excuse me, um, of like the Orca model, which could transcend what's being done with Transformers, but I don't have any insight on that right now 